How does a well-known superhero kind of go legit? Welcome to the Complete Story Series. I bring you trade paperbacks and single issues, and I break them down to that adjustable bites to help you understand. Then I read it dramatically back to you. All directions of the panel, six, and images are to prevent copyright problems, and all art is owned by its respective companies. Now for Scott Lang, not much has been going on. Finally, he started going to the gym. He caught up on all three seasons of Homeland, and other than that, well, his security business is doing okay, so that's a good thing. Today they have a big contract meeting coming up, and Scott wants to make sure that they don't screw up. That and also Mary Morgenstern would be pretty upset. When Scott went to go visit Mary earlier, she explained how important this deal is. She also had to pull some strings to get him a shot at handling the security for one of the biggest museums in the city. So her name is on the line if he bombs this. Mary, who is actually the largest investor into Scott's security firm, tells him that he cannot be late for this, and Scott tells her not to worry. He just has to make a quick pit stop first, which happened to be go to his daughter's high school basketball game. As Scott is watching in the back, he thinks about how Cassie has been through a lot, having just had heart surgery a few months ago. But as the game goes on, her team doesn't win. So Scott doesn't feel so bad, feeling that other team's locker with a bunch of ants. He then follows Cassie as she gets into her car with her mother, and Cassie tells her mother how she hates basketball. That girl that blocked her shot, she was like 30. Cassie continues on stating how things have become boring ever since she stopped being a superhero. And her mother tells her to try and look on the lighter side of things. She got some good pictures of her on the court, so maybe Cassie will want to send some to her dad? Cassie says, why? He never shows up to any of my games. All he does is shrink when things get serious. He'll just find a way to disappoint you. But Scott is actually shrunken in listening in on this. And he thinks about how much it hurts to hear that. And there's so much that he wishes that he could say, but he can't. Like how she never really got sick. It was actually some crazy psycho named Darren Cross that stole her heart for the pin particles inside of her. But she's fine now. As long as he stays away, she'll be safe. Over at Cross Technical Enterprises, Darren and his son Augustine go to meet with someone that they are intending to invest in for app development. The two men go to meet with a man named The Power Broker. And Darren tells him that investing in an app is worthless. He has other things that he should be worrying about. But The Power Broker tells him, of course, that's exactly why you need the Hench app. Over at the museum, Scott meets up with Mary and Fritz Harden to discuss their possible contract. But Fritz tells him that the police wanted to send someone to make sure that this was even a good idea. So please welcome Detective Blake Burdick. Blake tells Fritz that they would like to work closely with private security firms, but hiring Scott Lang? That is a bad idea. He's an ex-convict for starters. Scott tries to defend his firm even though he's an ex-con and he tells Fritz how they have a new response for weather emergencies like hurricanes or tornadoes. And as Scott looks back, a voice tells him, well, that's close enough. Soon, Whirlwind appears and begins destroying the museum. And Scott tells everyone to stay calm. The villain is just trying to rob the museum. But Whirlwind stops him and tells him, I'm actually here for you. Scott tells him that he doesn't mean that. And then Whirlwind begins to beat down Scott. Back at Darren Cross's office, him and Augustine watch as Whirlwind continues to beat down Scott. But when Darren says that he finally gets to watch Scott die, the broker tells him, well, you could if this wasn't a free trial. Broker goes on to state that this was just a test to show him what the app could do. But he won't have Scott killed for free. If Darren wants to invest maybe 1.2 billion, and Darren Cross tells him that is way too much, criminal even. And the broker looks at him, what a shame. I guess we'll just have to cancel the assassination. Back with Scott though, Whirlwind gets notice that the assassination has been canceled. And he also got three new followers on the hand chap. As Whirlwind leaves, Scott watches as everyone else leaves. And Mary tells him that she'll be seeing him in the office. Later, Scott goes to visit another potential job with Marlena Howard, who is in the middle of interviewing the magician when she was telling him that they're not interested in a magic act. As Scott and Marlena walk off, the magician tells him that he has powers and an assistant. They will regret this. Scott tells her that that sounded very ominous. And Marlena says, good thing she's interviewing for extra security then. And that's when she turns to Scott to tell him that she has a job for him. But he can't know who it's for until he signs an NDA. Scott asks if the security will be for a show. And Marlena tells him, well, for starters, yes. The client's actually moving here to film a reality show. So if it works out, this could be long term. After Scott finishes signing the NDA, Marlena brings him into their client's dressing room, which happens to be Darla Deering. Darla slams her fist down and yells, Scott? You see... Darla Deering and Scott Lang dated when Darla Deering was the she-thing and Scott was, well, Ant-Man, and they were both on the Fantastic Four. This was quite a while ago, though. 
But during his period on the Fantastic Four with Darla, it was kind of a rough time for Scott. He was still mourning the death of his daughter, but as Scott and Darla began to date, Cassie came back to him and Scott may have forgotten to ever talk to Darla again. Darla puts her power rings together and she becomes Miss Thing once again. And she begins to pummel Scott, calling him a jerk. Scott dodges around and he tells Darla, look, I know you're mad. And Darla tells him, that's not even the half of it. Your little disappearing act. And then she's stopped by a voice. And the voice ends the sentence with disappearing act. Scott says, finally, someone with even worse timing than him. And Darla asks who it is. Scott tells her that it's that magician that Marlena didn't hire. So he's probably here for revenge murder. Darla then looks at him. Are you kidding? And Scott whispers to the magician that they're working on some stuff, so maybe he should come back later. Perhaps he should attack during the show. The magician tells him, yeah, that's right. But in my defense, it is my first day as a murderer. And soon he begins to let doves and rabbits loose against them. Scott tells him that his bunnies are cute, and then they begin trying to bite Scott, and the magician tells him that they are cute genetically modified murder bunnies. He then begins to monologue, but Scott stops him, telling him a lot of villains stop doing the secret origin thing. And magician asks him why. But before he can get an answer, Darla punches him in the face and tells him, because they find it pretty distracting. Later, Scott and Darla sit down and talk about their past. As Scott tells her that he's sorry for disappearing like that, she deserved better. But Darla tells him that at least she got some closure this time. As Scott sits alone, he begins to think about how great it would be if he had someone that he could depend on. And then he hears a voice. And it's Sam Wilson, Captain America. And Scott thinks, yeah, I think he'll do. Sam tells Scott that he is in need of some help, and the two head back to Scott's office. Sam explains that there is currently a freighter shipping out of Miami today. It has a false name on it, but it's actually a shield transport, and they're carrying something very dangerous. And if it fell into the wrong hands, well, really bad things would happen because the really bad hands are already aboard the ship. Some guy called the hijacker. Scott asks if he's just trying to make sure the ship gets where it has to go, and Sam tells him not exactly, and that's when Scott realizes Sam wants to steal it. Scott tells him he's not sure about this whole Sam versus S.H.I.E.L.D. thing. And if you're curious about that, then check out our Sam Wilson Captain America stories following all new, all different Marvel. That whole battle's going on there. But Sam responds with, the thing on that ship is something you wouldn't want Maria Hill's hands on. And Scott responds with, she's pretty terrifying, isn't she? So what is it? Sam won't tell him, telling him it's classified, but Scott decides he can trust him. So the two of them decide they're going to get a move on for it. Later, they sneak aboard the ship, and while Sam goes to handle the hijacker, Scott goes to look for the cargo that Sam instructed him to get. When Scott returns to tell Sam he got it, the ship begins to rumble, and Sam asks, which container did you actually take? What do you mean? The one you wrote down. Oh wait, that's a seven! Below, an egg begins to hatch, and out of it, Giganto jumps up. Scott says that in his defense, Sam's handwriting is really terrible. And Sam tells him, just focus on the problem at hand here, Scott. Giganto jumps off the ship and begins to head towards the city. So Scott and Sam begin to chase after it. Once they get close enough, Scott jumps off onto Giganto, and as it comes crashing into a building, Scott manages to shrink it down to the same size as him, causing it to just bounce off the window. Later, after Sam has given his statement to the press, he informs Scott that the hijacker was giving up everyone. Seems he was hired by the slug through this new app called Hench that the power broker started. And right now, Sam needs to go handle some Hydra stuff. So he'll take care of the power broker and slug in about a week or so. But Scott asks, him, maybe I should take care of him for you, Sam. So Sam tells him, for the record, these are Captain America villains? And Scott tells him, well, yeah, Captain America, Captain America villains. I'll be fine. Elsewhere on Slug's yacht, Slug tells Power Broker, oh, it's funny, Maria Hill outbid him on Giganto, and look what happened. Broker says, well, after this trial run, we can go ahead and sign you up for the premium membership. But Slug says, about that. Slug hands his phone over to Broker and tells him, you're not exactly the only app doing what you do. And that's when Broker begins to watch. The video is of Crossfire selling the exact same app for half the cost of the brokers. Slug jokingly tells him, can I call you power broke, ah, uh, now? So Broker flies off after blowing up Slug's yacht. And after a while of flying, he alerts Siri to tell the development crew that it's time to upgrade their services to 2.0. Later, Scott heads over to meet up with Darla for his first day of work with her, which he's already late to. But as Scott tries to defend the fact that he's late, he then vanishes and appears on Darla, telling her to pretend that he's not here. She asks why, and that's when she sees Cassie in the stands and asks, why is she here? Scott tells her that she's in this basketball phase. Remember when I asked you if you had any extra tickets? Well, they were for her, but she doesn't know that I gave them to her. All she knows is that she thinks that her coach gave them to her. Darla tells him, okay, but that doesn't explain why she can't see him. And Scott stops her and tells her that it's a long, Awful story, don't sweat it. But then, as the celebrity charity basketball invitational begins, Darla meets up with her boyfriend, Paul Shear. After making it completely awkward for both Darla and Scott, Paul tells them that they will have to excuse him, he's gonna get his other game on. Scott says that he seems great, and Darla says that if you mean he returns calls, then yes. 
However, up in the announcer's box, a man appears and interrupts the current announcer, who responds with, he was kind of in the middle of, but then the previous man stops him and tells him, yes, you were about to punch yourself. The announcer begins punching himself and the man pushes him to the side and tells everyone that it's time to make some noise. He goes on to explain that everything has changed and this is now brought to you by the new app, Lackey. Now I wanna spend a moment to tell you guys about a recent lab experiment that I was in. I gained the ability to make people do whatever I want just by listening to me, which gave me the name of The Voice. Voice begins to tell everyone in the even number chairs to start fighting with people in the odd number chairs and soon the arena erupts and everyone begins fighting and beating each other. While everyone begins fighting, Scott hears a voice calling out to him, asking, you didn't think I noticed you eyeing my girl? He turns around to see Paul is about to fight with him. Paul tells Scott that he now faces the ticklish dragon, who he's battled many times in my nightmares. But as Paul begins to go on, Darla changes into Miss Thing and knocks him out. Tells Scott to not tell him that it was her that knocked him out. She wants this to work out. Scott flies up to the announcer's box and begins to beat down on voice, asking, who hired you? Was it Slug? Hydra? Wait, write it down. Not gonna fall for that one again. And then the voice points down to Paul. Paul tells Darla that he thought it was a game like Candy Crush. They even give you a Bed Bath & Beyond gift card for your first lackey hire. Once everything is settled, Cassie finally realizes that Scott was actually there. So the two of them go off to have a talk. She asks, what is he even doing here? And Scott tells her that it's for a job, for Darla. But Cassie stops him and tells him, it's always about your stupid job. And Scott tells her, well, it's because of my job that you got your ticket, oops. Realizing Scott has actually been following her, Cassie asks if he's been spying on her the whole time while he was ant-sized. He tries to calm her down, but Cassie tells him no. That is messed up. You're supposed to be my dad, not my stalker. Cassie then tells him, you know what? You don't have to worry about hiding around me anymore because I don't want you to ever come around me again. For real this time. And she walks off. Scott sits alone on the beach and he begins to think about being a superhero is just so hard. Kind of like when him and Giant Man had their thing. Well, it could have been worse. Oh wait, Scott's in jail too. There's that, and we'll find out how we got in jail next time on the Ant-Man storyline. Hope you guys enjoyed this, and if you want more Ant-Man, give this video a like, because we're getting into a few new superheroes to see what you guys think about them, and I need to know which stories to continue, and which ones to kind of leave where they are so you guys can go buy the books if you want to. So give this video a like, and follow me on Twitter, at ComicStory, and Instagram at ComicStory, and I'll see you next time right here.